Well, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, and thank you, Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Carter, for your kind introduction. I would like to recognize the Chair of History, Carla Pastana, the Chair of African American Studies, Marcus Hunter, the Chair of the Academic Senate, Michael Morantz, and Dean of the Social Sciences, Darnell Hunt. Hello campus and family and friends. It is such a great honor to deliver the 127th Faculty Research Lecture at UCLA. To be chosen is a wonderful distinction in itself, but particularly so for me this year because as a scholar of African American history who has spent virtually my entire career at UCLA, thanks for those retentions, um, 2019 is very special. It is the 50th anniversary of Ethnic Studies at UCLA, the 100th anniversary of UCLA, and also the 400th commemorative year of the arrival of 20 and odd Africans to what would become the United States and the largest slave society in the Americas. I am so grateful to the many people who have supported me along the way. Unfortunately, I only have time to mention a few today. I would like to thank the selection committee members, especially Chair Ephraim Cristal, who's wonderfully off in Berlin, and I'm jealous, uh, and my contact over the past several months for all things associated with this distinguished lecture, Kirsty Matsushima, my family, that is my parents, my husband James, and daughter Emma, as well as my sisters Beverly and Iris, my fictive daughter, Professor Maureen Campbell, and my other students, both undergraduate and graduate, all have provided me with great inspiration to do the work that I have had the privilege to undertake. My time at UCLA has been blessed by assistance from many wonderful faculty and staff colleagues in the History Department, African American Studies, and across the campus. They include, but are not limited to, um, professors Ellen Dubois, Stephen Aaron, Teo Ruiz, Ronald Ann Malore, Robert Hill, Robin Kelly, Claudia Mitchell Kernan, Joan Waugh, M. Belinda Tucker, Lynn Hunt, Peg Jacob, Kevin Tarasiano, David Myers, John Laslett, Richard Von Galan, it's a big department, people, um, the late Peter Ryle, Kelly Lila Hernandez, Andrew Apter, Cheryl Keyes, Reynaldo Macias, Yvonne Beren, Nancy Dennis, Ebony Shaw, Verna Abe, Murray Potala, Ann Major, Jan Freeman, Charles Alexander, and particularly former EVC and Provost Scott Waugh. I also would like to acknowledge Ben Nickel and his family who generously endowed um, the chair that I hold, um, and Father Paul Vigil, who is my pastor at St. Timothy's Catholic Church. Last but certainly not least, I thank God from whom all my blessings flow. I grew up with my mother telling me stories about our enslaved ancestors' lives along the Gullah coast of South Carolina. My father knew or said little about those captives from whom he had been descended in North Carolina. He also did not seem to appreciate my mother's fascination with the past and with the people who worked the southern tobacco, sugar, cotton, and rice fields for generations before the Jubilee of Freedom. My father's displeasure did not deter my mother. She continued with her stories, and in time, and very unexpectedly for both of us, they became my passion and my stories. They were truly one of her many miraculous gifts to me. The reminiscences that my mother gained from her own mother helped to ground me in an oral tradition that demanded that the voices of the enslaved be heard, and be heard clearly. My undergraduate folklore professor at the University of Virginia, Charles Perdue, and John Blassingay, my graduate advisor at Yale, reified this methodological praxis. As an historian of enslaved women from Africa to the Americas, particularly North America, I have spent much of my work trying to understand and acknowledge these women's realities, ideas, ideals, work, art, knowledge, and even fantasies Enslaved people could be deftly secretive, carefully constructing an elusiveness that persists even today. When I was in Southern Virginia researching and writing what became my first monograph, 
driving through the forests and swamplands were unknown members uh, unknown numbers of black people had taken their refuge from the madness of their enslavement. I would imagine these phantoms playing hide and seek masterfully with me. It is not that they did not want themselves or their stories eventually to be found out, but was I worthy or skilled enough to uncover the cloistered scenes of their bittersweet existence? Who among them should I look to for guidance? One of the first important lessons that I learned when trying to work my way through the truths, deceptions, and confusions overlaid in their scattered sources and muffled voices is that women tell women's stories, at least the women I study. They speak, whisper, rhyme, joke, sing, hum, hum, sew, embroider, quilt, weave, braid, and dance to and for their intimate audiences of daughters, friends, kin, and thankfully, sometimes to interviewers who record them, the bits and pieces of their own and of other women's scabbed over histories. My storytellers elucidate truths that might have been hidden during their lives or that perhaps were always there in plain sight but were either ignored or dismissed. They impart with these insightful anecdotes for multiple reasons, to teach, affirm, and honor the existence of those disremembered because they were black, female, impoverished, invisible in the law, and wholly unacceptable to our national narrative of equality and opportunity. Others, a much smaller group, did so for very different reasons, in order to warn or even harm the listener or the memory of the subject. Neither storytellers nor their subjects, or stories for that matter, were ever pure or perfect. It is, of course, our responsibility as historians to painstakingly contextualize and query what we encounter. Most of all, however, we must be careful listeners. Those enslaved or formerly enslaved women who recount the lives of other bonded females and tell of their lives as well reward the careful listener with great gifts. Today, I want to assume, if I may, the role of Rancontour as I tell you about three of those female storytellers who have been important to me as an historian, Annie Williams, Fanny Berry, and Susan Snow, and the lives of the enslaved whom they chronicled. Two of my storytellers were from the Upper South, one from the Deep South. None have any real claim to fame. All three lived long enough. Uh, long enough in the 19th century to gain freedom at the time of general emancipation in 1865. Each through their slices of biographies of one or other in, or more enslaved women whom they knew taught, uh, taught me something profoundly important about the lived and imagined experiences of captive black women. Lessons that I have recorded in my work and aspire to share with you today. Storyteller one. Annie Williams recalls Aunt Rebecca Coles. Hers is a story of religiosity and social evolution. Annie's story kept me thinking for months about the possible fluidity and its limits of an enslaved woman's social place in the antebellum South. Rebecca's story, or at least um, the way in which Annie relays it, suggests to me the potential transformative impact of religion on an enslaved woman's social identity, both within her own black community as well as within the white community. Annie Williams had been the slave of Robert Coles of Powhatan County, Virginia, in the decades prior to the Civil War. When interviewed during the 1930s as a part of the Virginia WPA effort, her description of some of the religious practices of her owner, his family, and his bonds people emerged. According to Williams, her master Coles was a religious man who prayed with the family every single night. His prayer meetings were mandatory for his slaves as well, who had to, quote, come to the parlor same as the whites. Among this body of captive black congregants, one woman's presence struck Williams as particularly noteworthy. Aunt Rebecca was an elderly enslaved woman who not only attended the meetings, but actively participated. She often would give lengthy, passionate prayers, garnering the attention and respect of the others. Williams was struck by this phenomenon for two obvious reasons. Aunt Rebecca was a woman, and she was a slave. It was especially unusual, women's, uh, Williams suggested, because of Rebecca's gender. And I quote, Aunt Rebecca used to get up and pray regular, 
Annie explained. Didn't let women do much praying in them days, end of quote. Annie's conclusion regarding the lack of prominence of women in Southern religious traditions was largely correct. It was especially so for enslaved women. Quote, but Massa never saw Aunt Rebecca down, pray sometimes for half an hour when white folks would sit there just as respectful as if it was the white preacher, end of quote. So too, no doubt, did the other enslaved men and women who were present. Annie Williams was openly impressed with the respect from her master and his family that Aunt Rebecca commanded, keenly aware of the apparent transformative power that Rebecca's religiosity had on the elderly slave women's social status. While she prayed, neither slaveholders nor slaves responded to Rebecca as a social inferior. Traditionally, a southern enslaved woman's race, gender, and certainly her slave status would have isolated her fundamentally from this type of social reception among slaveholding whites. Yet Master Coles was moved by Rebecca's passionate expression of her and his Christian faith. He and his family enjoyed hearing her pray. They also, no doubt, wanted her acceptance of their religion to be an example to their other um, bonds people. What's more, Robert Coles probably felt secure that Rebecca's prayers would not undermine his command as master. He was, after all, present at these meetings and could have stopped her devotions if he felt a need to do so. And Rebecca's gender may have helped to reassure him that her social prominence or even power, at best, was a tightly prescribed one. The phenomenon of Aunt Rebecca's reception as a spiritual leader among the Coles slaves was equally complex, but for different reasons. In many instances, Rebecca's gender would have curved her accessibility to public power within her own community, particularly if women were not in the majority. It is certain that some elderly enslaved women derived social leverage from their perceived memory, wisdom, and proximity to the ancestral. Aunt Rebecca's obvious knowledge of religious texts and perhaps both, quote, the memory and practice of female leaders in some traditional African religions, rituals, and healing practices, and as storytellers, created some space for black female moral and religious authority in slave communities, even in those communities where their masters did not order them to attend daily Christian worship service. No matter how Aunt Rebecca came to her elevated position on the Coles estate, her social acceptance and visibility at their, bi at their biracial religious meetings uh, that cut deeply across entrenched racial, class, and cultural lines was more than a little impressive. Indeed, it's clear that from both the perspective of her master and that of the enslaved, Aunt Rebecca was an important communal and cultural bridge between the white and black worlds that they inhabited. As such, Rebecca wielded some social power, albeit situationally bound, that was rare for enslaved women. I use the term social power in this context merely as the ability of enslaved women to have a social presence and influence recognized beyond typical boundaries for that time and place. Traditionally, the social power of enslaved women was relegated to the intimate world of their immediate and extended kin. As wives, daughters, and particularly as mothers, enslaved Southern women exerted cultural and material sway within their own households. They were, after all, the primary caretakers and most responsible for the material well-being and socialization of their children. Enslaved mothers shaped the social dynamics of slave life, teaching through example, moral tales, jokes, songs, lectures, and responsive punishments, the do's and don'ts of life, labor, and morality within and outside of their families and communities. African-American women like Aunt Rebecca, who were regarded as religious leaders, managed to craft a public authoritorial status rooted in maternal and elderly reverence, along with the deep respect that many enslaved people and a small number of whites afforded a bondsperson of obvious spiritual enlightenment and moral superiority. Given that most Southern whites scoffed at the notion of a morally superior black woman, Aunt Rebecca's reception at the prayer meeting was truly remarkable. It is not certain that she, that her social ambitions might have, uh, what they might have been when she took the floors most night to pray at the Coles farm. It is not definite that she had any at all, or if she was socially aspirational, that her yearning figured into her animated presence at the prayer meetings. 
What is reasonable to surmise, however, is that an enslaved woman's religious beliefs and expression, her religiosity, if you will, provided her with unique opportunities to redefine herself socially vis-a-vis -vis slaves and slaveholders. Taking on the cloak and substance of a religious persona endowed Aunt Rebecca with the power to craft for herself a new category of socially redemptive identity, that of religious woman. A comprehensive definition of that term cannot be located in one isolated primary source such as Annie Williams' very short biographical narrative. Annie's story of Rebecca, however, did encourage me to look for others. What I discovered when I did so was that antebellum slave women's texts collectively suggest that for a bound woman to be religious in the various sacred traditions that they were actively crafting and or sustaining meant taking on a number of personal and personality traits that had layered meanings and significance in their lives and in the lives of those whom they came to regard, who came to regard them as special. As women of religion, slave female converts and prostlers, I'm sorry, I knew I was gonna screw up that word, like um, Aunt Rebecca, exhibited um, in their daily actions that they were trustworthy, generous, wise, pious, selfless, and importantly, not without self-esteem. They believed in and projected to their public the ability of their God or gods to transform and save them from evil and to embolden them to be fearless um, in the face of ungodliness. Being part of a religious womanhood, therefore, gave enslaved women the opportunity to expand both vertically and horizontally the traditional social space reserved for them in Southern slave society. It united them in a community that was not necessarily bound by gender, race, legal status, or class. Their affiliation with this community, or religious women and men, empowered enslaved women not only to construct different social identities for themselves as individuals, but also to undermine, resist, and challenge some of the racism and misogyny that was endemic in the lives of enslaved women. Storyteller two. Fanny Berry and her memory of Suki, a story of sex and sensibility. Fanny Berry was born the property of George Abbott of Appomattox County, Virginia. This is actually a photograph of her taken in the 1930s. Her owner was a man of moderate means. In 1850, when Fanny already was an adolescent and responsible for contributing a substantive amount of labor for her owner's financial well-being, Abbott and his wife Sarah Ann owned real estate valued at almost 2,011 enslaved people. Fanny Berry, like Annie Williams and Aunt Rebecca, grew up in the rural world of the antebellum Upper South, in a place and time in which corn, tobacco, and cotton were the local planter and farming classes, financial mainstay, with land and slaves their most valuable resources. Fanny relished her role as a keeper and teller of stories about the enslaved women she loved, worked with, admired, and perhaps envied. When interviewed during the 1930s, Fanny was full of information about her life as a child and young slave woman. Fanny worked both in the fields and as a domestic. She seemed to have been a favorite of her mistress, not only because she actually was the property of her mistress, Mrs. Abbott, and not Mr. Abbott, but also because Fanny was a constant companion to the Abbott's young son, Tom. Mrs. Abbott trusted Fanny with running errands, which allowed the slave child a larger view of the world around her than many other enslaved youth. As a teen, Fanny was well known in her slave neighborhood. She loved dance parties in the local quarters and regaled her friends with her fine dance moves, uh, performing with a cup of water on her head while she was setting the flow, cutting the pigeon wings, and going to the east and going to the west. Fan you can just imagine. Fanny also entertained them with work songs, jokes, and riddles. Like so many enslaved people in the antebellum South, Fanny believed in an active, ancestrally driven spirit world. Females were particularly important on the farm in which Fanny was raised because they outnumbered the males, and the Abbots rented out most of their men, uh, the men they owned, to work on the construction of the Southside Railroad. Females also dominated the slaves held by George Abbott Sr., Fanny's master's namesake and uncle, who lived nearby and whose bonds people were a crucial part of Fanny's larger black community. 
Additionally, when the Abbots hired Fanny out, she resided with other enslaved women on their farms. The female enslaved presence spatial, psychological, social, moral, sexual, and cultural, thoroughly saturated Fanny's worldview, intellect, fears, and imagination. In her older years, Fanny became, Fanny became an avid chronicler of their lives, a devotee of their memory and of their complex and layered female community. The historical text comprising the interview that Fanny Berry, or series of interviews, that she gave as a 96-year-old woman is an important descriptive narrative of female identity, community, morality, and idealism among enslaved people in the pre-Civil War South. Crisscrossing the persons, events, and attitudes which were a part of her life, Berry presents her audience not only with her own story, but also with an array of stories detailing the paramount aspects of the lives of other girls and women whom she had known. Fanny tells of the courageous and clever Mammy Lou, who hid a self-emancipated man chased by patrollers between her legs and under a quilt. Oh my. Uh, her Mamelou symbolized one of enslaved women's most vital contributions to their families um, and communities. Their ability, uh, or some of their, uh, some of their contributions, their ability to give life, their protective maternal nature, their domestic productivity in the form of the quilt, and their feminine um, sexuality. But Fanny Berry's narratives hardly stopped with Mammy Lou. There also was Aunt Nellie, who chose to die by suicide rather than elude another brutal beating. Rachel, who managed to find her way back to her family after being stolen and illegally sold. Secretive Polly, who kept her free black husband hidden in her root cellar. The child Daphne, who after general emancipation chose to live with her former master and mistress rather than be reunited with her black family. Barry even discussed white women, most eagerly her consistently compromised slave mistress, Miss Sarah Ann Abbott, who became, in Fanny's telling, a perfect paradox of her time, place, and gender. To quote Fanny directly, Miss Sarah Ann was a fine woman, even if she was a slaveholder. There are many iconic female portrayals in Barry's account. Her intertextualization of these diverse biographies provided me with a rich source of information about Southern female communities. Fanny's stories were the source of incredible gifts to me. They projected essential themes that collectively pointed to vital aspects of enslaved women's behavioral conventions, self-reliance, self-determination, communal respect, maternal sacrifice, and resistance. She spoke to the absolute importance of their existence in their families, communities, and the larger um, Southern society. It was indeed through recalling and explaining the lives of these females that Fannie Berry found her own voice and purpose. Outside, of course, of her performance as labor and wife, she was their historian. It was her duty and desire, her narrative voice projects, to set the record straight regarding the lives of black women in slavery. Indeed, Fanny was so wedded to her chosen role as purposeful official biographer of these women that she fought for recognition as such. When challenged by her WPA interviewer, she, the well-regarded and formally educated black female teacher, Susie Bird, about the validity of some of her memories, the elderly former slave woman snapped back at Mrs. Bird. How come I don't remember? Don't tell me I don't, cause I do. I don't care if it's been done been a thousand years. I know what Master said, and it's as fresh as it was that day um, he said it. And she looks like she could say that. <laughs> I have learned a great deal from all of Fanny's um, story-bound gifts but none of them stirred my intellectual imagination more than the tale of Suki. Suki was the Abbott House slave who Barry confides, Mr. Abbott was always trying to, quote, make his gal. One day while Suki was in the kitchen making soap, Mr. Abbott attempted to rape her. First he pulled her dress down to her waist and then tried to push her onto the floor. Next, according to Barry, quote, that black gal got mad, end of quote. Suki decided to fight back. Fanny recalled gleefully how Suki, quote, took and punched old master and made him break loose, and then she gave him a shove and pushed his hind parts down in the hot pot of soap. Soap was near to boiling, and it burned him near to death. 
he got up holding his hind parts and ran from the kitchen, not daring to yell, because he didn't want Miss Sarah Ann to know about it. That is to realize that he'd assaulted and tried to rape her slave woman. A few days later, Mr. Abbott took Suki to the local slave market in Petersburg to sell. Okay, well, we saw that coming. Suki again faced sexual abuse and physical invasion as potential buyers stared, poked, and pinched her and checked to see the soundness of her teeth. According to Fanny, Suki's anger resurfaced. Standing on the block, quote, she pulled her dress up and told those old trays to look and to see if they could find any teeth down there. <laughs> the punch laugh of Fanny, which she probably added with much relish, quote, Massa never did bother slave gals no more, end of quote. Many witnesses at the slave market in Petersburg, which I used to live in, by the way, uh, that day, no doubt thought Suki vulgar and promiscuous, the typical white public's assessment of black females. Not surprisingly, Fanny Berry, a woman who also could personally attest to the kind of rage which emerged when enslaved women like Suki were confronted with attempts to dehumanize and harm them, concluded something altogether different about Suki's moral character and sensibility. Fanny realized, and very much appreciated, that Suki had exacted a high price from her master and the slave trader. True, she lost her community of slave friends and perhaps kin when Mr. Abbott sold her in retaliation for her resistance to his acts of sexual aggression, but she did manage to deny her, quote unquote, owner, his supposed right to claim her sexually, what some enslaved women referred to as their, quote, female principle, end of quote. Suki also demanded that her new buyer and the other witnesses at the flesh market that day have to reckon not only with her outrage, but her identity as a woman, a human being with a body that could produce another human being, not just a work animal who could be bred at will or whose value could be assessed by looking at his teeth. No one knows what became of Suki. She probably ended up, as did hundreds of thousands of men and women from Virginia, toiling in the cotton and sugar fields of the Deep South. But her presence, her sacrifice, and her victory lived on in the lore of Fanny Berry and others who repeated this part of Suki's biography as an example of enslaved women's heroism and humanity. Suki was the woman whose act of courageous defiance put an end to George Abbott's sexual abuse of his slave women and girls. His fear of being found out by Miss Sarah Ann, who owned most of their property anyway, um, and being made to seem the weak master by the likes of house gal Suki, seemed to have been too much for poor Master Abbott to risk by continuing his violent predatory pursuits. Fanny's story of Suki um, em embodied important gifts to me in my quest to know and analyze enslaved women's sensibilities regarding their feminine and sexual selves. Neither Fanny nor Suki, under other circumstances, probably would have approved of publicly bearing their sexual organs. Enslaved women generally frowned on blatant uh, female sexual exhibition or promiscuity, yet few were ashamed of their sexuality or the promise of sexual pleasure and human procreation that they, as women, embodied. Their sexual expression and experience, like other realms of their behavior, were guided by communally sanctioned rules rules that helped Suki to muster the courage to physically hinder her master's rape. S Storyteller three, Susan Snow, Life with Mother, the Black African. Susan's gifts embodied in her stories are lessons about the limits of family ties, resistance, and freedom. Her narrative illustrates generational cultural differences and, suggest, and some of their negative, even tragic consequences within enslaved families and communities. Susan's story is the longest and last by, of my storytellers today. Unlike the sites of Annie and Fanny's narratives, Susan's story is located in the Deep South, in Mississippi and Alabama. Her account crosses temporal boundaries, leaping through the last half of the antebellum era and into the early Jim Crow decades. It is a unique story of a woman, Venus, born free after the end um, of the legal international trade, but nonetheless captured and smuggled into the South. Venus only had been enslaved for a few decades by the end of the Civil War. Susan, the storyteller, was Venus's daughter. <laughs> 
Susan was born in Alabama and sold as a baby with her mother in about 1853. William J. Snow in Jasper County, Mississippi purchased them. Susan and Venus left the Snow's farm in 1865, immediately after learning of their freedom. It is doubtful that the two took anything with them except pieces of clothing and perhaps a few household items, textiles, pipes, and crockery usually, that Venus had accumulated in her cabin. Susan had lived mostly with the Snows, the owners, or in the homes of people whom the Snows hired her out to as a nurse or domestic, but not with her mother. Venus was a field worker and resided in the Snows' slave quarters. She lived in the quarters, but was not a part of the slave community. According to Susan, African Venus had not managed or perhaps had not wanted to create close ties with anyone with the exception of her daughter. It must have been a very lonely social world for Venus, especially after the, souls, the snows removed her child from her cabin. Quote, quote, my mom was the first to leave the plantation after the surrender, Susan recalled. Quote, all the other slaves had a contract to stay, but she didn't. She went to Newton County and hired out. She never wanted to stay in one place, no how, end of quote. Venus felt no ties to the land where she had been enslaved. Perhaps the memory of her homeland was still too profound. Maybe her loss of her three homes, at least one in Africa and two in the U.S. prior to gaining freedom, had left Venus with the stark reality that for her, home and family were embodied in her daughter and her fading memories of a place and a people in Africa that she would never see again. There was no husband, other children, or kin. Susan's stories of her mother laid bare the haunting cultural and exp experiential spaces between the African and African American or Creole, even within the same family. Susan's family unit remained just the two of them for several years. Venus had no intention of trying to find Susan's father. When asked, she told her daughter that her father was, quote, so mean that she was glad to leave him behind when she and Susan were sold. Venus also made it clear to Susan that she would never marry, even though she was now free. Susan knew very little else about her father, who was so light in color that she, his offspring, was described as mulatto. The few details that her mother allowed her suggest that Venus wanted to conceal from Susan that her father actually was a white man and that she was a product of rape. Susan's very light skin color, her mother's characterization of her father as a brute, and their sales soon after Susan's birth strongly suggest that Venus had been bound to a sexually abusive white man, a white man whom she absolutely detested. Susan's narrative makes it clear that for her African mother, freedom at the close of the Civil War fundamentally meant two things, mobility and control over her labor and body. Venus did not suffer fools or tyrants, and when she found herself in the comp company of either, she did not resist to fight or exit. Quote, if she had a crop half made and somebody made her mad, Susan explained, quote, she'd up and leave it and go somewhere else, end of quote. Venus sought a freedom that sometimes took her beyond the physical confines of daily contact with her daughter Susan, but she never moved very far away from her child. Throughout the remainder of their lives, mother and daughter remained within the geographical bound, geographic boundaries of five Black Belt counties tucked away in the upper southeast corner of Mississippi. Venus, or Vini as she was called, probably had been born in the Angle Congo area of Africa and sold as a young um, adolescent. Susan remembered that her mother told her that the chief made, quote, arrangements with some men, and they had a big goober grabbing of the, for the young folks. They stole my ma and some more and brought them to this country, end of quote. Venus became the property of a North Carolina slaveholder who eventually moved to Alabama. Once there, he sold the African woman and her infant son, uh, her infant Susan, to William Snow, who then re relocated them to Mississippi. No matter where Vini went, the outlandish African seemed to have been an outsider. When Mr. Snow purchased Venia and her daughter, for example, they became the only enslaved people on his property out of the 17 or 18 blacks he owned who were not related. Quote, all the slaves on the place was born in the family and kin, except my ma, Susan explained. 
Vani did not respond calmly to enslavement, nor did she readily assimilate the culture of the enslaved African Americans who lived around her. She refused, for example, to have the standard board floor in her cabin. Quote from um, Susan, every slave had a house of his own, but my mom never would have no board floor like the rest of them on account she was an African. She would only have a dirt floor. While Susan offered no evidence that Venus ever tried to run away, her mother was known to be, quote, mean and, quote, a fighter. Quote, my mom was a black African and she sure was wild and mean, Susan explained. Quote, she was so mean to me that I couldn't believe that she was my mammy, end of quote. Their owner and overseers considered Venus a valuable field worker, but they were afraid of her anger, physical prowess, and especially what they believed were her supernatural powers. Quote, they couldn't whip her, Susan recalled. They used to say she was a conjurer, and it was all scared of her, end of quote. Venus may not have been a conjurer. Those around her may have mistaken her use of traditional African medicines, language, and religious practice as the skills of a witch. In her mother's defense, Susan noted sympathetically, quote, but my mom was scared of conjures too, in the quote. Venus raised Susan to be like her, to resist domination, quote, I got more whippings than any other slave on the place, Susan recalled, quote, because I was mean like my mammy, in the quote. She went on to explain that she, what she meant by mean, and she explained it as, quote, always a fighting and a scratching with white and black, in the quote. But Susan could have mistaken her mother's expression of her multiple traumas or of capture, exile from her life in Africa, and abuse as an enslaved woman in America for general malevolence. She shared her mother's traumas and learned from her how to strike back. Susan recalled that she too was so rebellious that her owner reminded her of what happened to slaves who did, quote, harm to a white man. They were hanged. Venus also socialized her daughter to desire freedom. Once Susan was caught singing the praise of Abraham Lincoln that she had heard other enslaved people whispering, her song resulted in her mistress whipping her, quote, she made me submit, end of quote. I didn't know nothing about Abe Lincoln, she explained, but I hear he was trying to free the slaves and my mammy says she wanted to be free, end of quote. It is not surprising then that Mr. and Mrs. Snow did not ask Beanie and Susan to stay on and work after freedom or that Vinnie and Susan, at any rate, would have accepted such an offer. Venus was approximately 35 and Susan about 16 years old when emancipated. Despite their desire to exercise their freedom away from where they had been enslaved, practicality dictated that they still would live where they could find employment, and that was locally. Susan, as an experienced child nurse, had more work opportunities than her mother. Initially, however, they, um, they started off working together as sharecroppers. By 1870, that arrangement had ended. Susan went to work as a house servant for Jackson Craven, who was a nearby farmer. Venus continued to sharecrop, but um, in, neighboring, in a neighboring county. Sometime during that decade, the two reunited and moved again, this time to the nearby hamlet of Enterprise. Recalling the racially turbulent, often violent 1870s and 1880s, Susan explained how difficult it was for blacks newly freed to succeed. The Ku Klux was out nights, she explained. Quote, I heard tell about him whipping people, end of quote. She also learned, probably from those in contact with the Freedmen's Bureau, that blacks were supposed to receive some kind of formal assistance. In the end, however, Susan decried that, quote, they never got nothing to my knowledge except the government let them homestead land, end of quote. Homesteading was, in fact, why the two women went to Enterprise. While the details are not clear from Susan's account, it is possible that Venus tried to make, take advantage of the Southern um, Homesteading Act of 1866 that was meant to distribute public land to black and white Southerners who lived in Mississippi and other lower South states. According to Susan, however, her mother, quote, got mad like, uh, and left it like she always done, end of quote. Of course, there were a myriad of events and conditions that could have discouraged Venus. While the Southern Homestead Act was meant in part to help former slaves to attain land, for example, it was a full two years before Mississippi even opened a land office. Moreover, much of the land that was available was unfit for cultivation. 
without at least a few able-bodied workers who could cut timber and pull stumps to say nothing of the funds to purchase necessary farming equipment, create a farm out of this land, would have proven to be more than a little difficult for Venus and Susan. Once the two women left Enterprise, they escaped the Mississippi countryside for good. Sometime before 1880, mother and daughter relocated to Meridian, the county seat. Meridian was by then becoming something of a boom town, teeming with black and white migrants. Although Sherman torched it during the Civil War, the city's location at the junction of two major railroad lines made it a keen spot for New South industrial development. It was a place where at least Susan could find steady work as a child nurse and domestic. Despite what economic opportunities Meridian might have offered, however, it still was a dangerous place for freed women. In 1871, Meridian had been the site of a deadly race riot which, in which at least 30 blacks were killed and numerous black women raped and brutalized. The riot had several sources, but principally was related to white opposition to local Republican, that is white and black, political leadership and black land ownership. The KKK and other local vigilantes, as well as the contingent of like-minded men from neighboring, neighboring counties in Alabama, led the assault. Before it was over, they had killed three black lawmakers, a black policeman, and a white Republican judge. One free woman named Ellie Parton recalled that during the riot, companies of men raided her home three nights in a row. On the third night, they raped her. While Venus and Susan may not have been living in Meridian at the time of the riot, they certainly had heard the stories of racialized and gendered violence that took place. They must have hedged their bets carefully. Should they remain in the countryside where they could not make a living and be killed? There were, after all, 16 documented lynchings in that county, and Mississippi had the largest number of recorded lynchings, including two pregnant black sisters. Or raped without any hint of justice to be had. Or should they move to Meridian and at least have a chance at gainful employment? They chose Meridian. In 1880, Venus and Susan were not just living with each other. Census records indicate that also living in their household was another female named Katie. The girl was 11 years old, at school, a mulatto with an Irish father. Later census records reveal that Katie was Susan's daughter. Her father might have been Jackson Craven, for whom Susan worked as a, quote, housekeeper during the time that she and Venice had temporarily parted ways. Certainly by the time they moved to Meridian, Susan was known to live by her own social rules. According to her, she says, I cut loose in Meridian. And I'm quoting now, as a woman, but as prodigal. She, noticed, she noted of her rowdy behavior. She frequented juke joints and other night nice spots, often getting drunk, disorderly, and arrested. Her mother did not, or could not perhaps, come to her aid. Her employers did, quote, my white folks kept telling me if I got locked up one more time, they wouldn't pay the fine. But they done it again and again, she confessed. Further evidence of Susan's maternity was her work in Meridian, where she had at least one job as a wet nurse. Domestic service, of course, brought Susan in contact with and vulnerable to sexually aggressive white male employers. She also could have entered into a concubinage relationship, after all, without a husband, brother, father, or even paternally attached former master. Susan and Venus had fewer options for financial security or chance of avoiding physical or sexual abuse than those free women with male protection. Venus died sometime between 1880 and 1900, but Susan continued to tell the stories of her African mother and the life they had together, even after she had, been, uh, she had her own child and, ch and grandchildren. Telling her parents' story hopefully helped Susan better understand Venus and reconcile herself with the cultural and emotional distances and differences between the African parent and the African American child. It certainly informed my ideas about the evolution of culture, maternal behavior, and mother-child bonds, as well as discord within enslaved black families. By 1900, Susan was a renter, still working then as a washerwoman, and living with grandchildren Joe, Daisy, and Daisy's husband, Dale Allen. They lived in a community comprised largely of black renters who worked as day laborers, domestics, washerwomen, and carpenters. This community, at last, proved to be a stable one for Susan. 
She continued to live there or nearby for the remainder of her life, working in a steam laundry and living either with her grandson or alone. Daisy and Dale um, lived nearby. These two managed to purchase a home and took in boarders to help with their expenses. It is at this point that Susan Snow's story of Venus and her descendants three generation ends. This too is where my storytelling ends today. Thank you Annie Williams, Fanny Berry, and Susan Snow for your gifts of the stories of Aunt Rebecca, Suki, and Venus. Thank you Mother for a gift of starting me on this journey with your stories of the African girl sold from Virginia to South Carolina, one of my maternal great-great-grandmothers. These were stories passed on to my mother from my grandmother Florence. Thank you UCLA for this great honor and wonderful opportunity to share some of my work with you. Thank you. If, if we have the lights, I'll, I'll entertain some questions um, if we have some lights up. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, you mentioned quite a few times, you spoke to people's spiritual beliefs as well as their imagination, but I, I didn't hear much about the content. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about what were some of the beliefs that went beyond sort of... Um, traditional Christianity that you heard reflected in these stories. Could you speak a little bit more to the content of that, of some um, of those? Well, the great um, African-American historian and cultural historian Sterling Stuckey um, writes in his book, Slave Culture, that only about 15% of African-Americans who had been enslaved uh, at the time of emancipation were Christian in, this, in the quote-unquote traditional sense. And this kind of, you know, uh, it, it kind of works against what we typically think, which was that there were all these missionaries who were there, they had the Great Awakening, we have the, you know, revival meetings and all these kinds of things um, that took place in the South. Um, but African Americans really clung to um, traditional um, African religions. Uh, one third of those persons who were um, imported as, uh, as enslaved people were Islamic in faith. Um, and we do find on the Gullah Coast, the Geechee Coast, and other places as well, as Michael Gomez has documented, for example, and Margaret Washington and other people, um, some remnants of Islamic uh, belief and also ritual. Um, and so, uh, so you had that. Um, we also also know some people, if you look at the Gulf Coast, for example, also Florida, some places were, that were, um, uh, that were really, um, I guess, colonized by, had stellar coloni colonialism um, by the French um, or the Spanish. Um, some people, some of those people who arrived were baptized, were Catholicized, um, et cetera. Um, but what we do see mostly is that um, there's, there, combined with Christian beliefs and some of the um, vital um, parts of Christianity with um, traditional African um, beliefs too. I mean, people talk about hoodoo, they talk about voodoo, you know, we talk about the remnants of Vodun um, by the peoples of Dalmay, um, you know, so um, uh, expressions of perhaps um, Yoruba, um, um, religiosity um, as well. Um, some of the religious beliefs of the Mende peoples that we find particularly in South Carolina and Georgia among, you know, the, use, the sand, for example, and the Poro um, societies. So there is a lot going on there. It's a very rich um, uh, spiritual, um, religious, um, I would say, landscape. Okay, and so, uh, but uh, even at the time when the missionaries came down in large numbers, which was during the Civil War and right after the Civil War, um, in order to quote unquote standardize Christianity and, and a lot of the HBCUs established were to create both teachers and ministers who were, had standard Christianity, there was a lot of resistance. Okay, and so, you know, even in, in my own lifetime, I mean, with my mother, uh, who was from, the, as I said, the Gullah Coast, or the Beachy Coast of South Carolina, you know, her, her sisters and brothers who lived down there and she herself, you know, do very, very um, um, devout Christians, but, you know, they also, every once in a while, something would switch in, you know, and you're like, okay, what happened? What just happened here? You know, and so, um, you know, so they talk about, you know, somebody putting a root on somebody or, you know, making a kind of medication or something like that. And, 
you know. So it still existed there, this notion that there were spirits, that there were ancestral spirits in particular, that these spirits could, you know, confront you, that they would do things to you, that people could use for various medicines or roots or whatever to affect, some, to have some kind of effect on you or whatever. It was very much alive in, in the generation of my mother, probably still for my cousins as well, who who reside there. So we, we see this replicated over and over and over and over again. A very fine presentation, Brenda. Thank you, uh, Ellen. <laughs> um, can you talk about the evolution of your understanding that to really grasp the experience of slavery, you had to move back into understanding African roots and how that developed in your own work? Well, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I, I'm moving back. I try, I grapple with learning African history as I have since I was an undergraduate. And Joseph Miller, if you do African history, you know him. Uh, Joseph Miller was my professor at the University of Virginia. Um, so I've spent a lot of time um, trying to learn more and more and more. And there always seems to be more and more and more to learn, Andy. So, um, <laughs> So I, I try to do that, and whenever I, I give a talk and I say anything, the people like Andrew in the in the um, audience will go like, "Oh my God, what is she thinking? This woman doesn't know what she's talking about." But we'll talk about that later. Um, at, at any rate, um, I, I have wanted to know more and more, and I have wanted to understand what are the connections because I've ever since I was um, either with Joe Miller or you know Sylvia Boone, who was at Yale, or Robert Ferris Thompson at Yale, um, etc. I've wanted to understand understand as much as I could about culture, you know, and about cultural evolution and about how, you know, people who were African were African became African American and what that evolution looked like. You know, so when I found this story of um, Venus, um, the African, and her daughter Susan, you know, it was very clear that there were big cracks in their understanding of one another. There were big breaks, you know, more than most mothers and daughters. And that that was because of the cultural differences, but also the tra trauma differences, the, the kinds of traumas that her mother had, you know, when she was taken in Middle Passage, when she was first enslaved, when she was raped, et cetera, that, um, that Susan didn't have. Um, and her expression of her mother as being mean and wild and all these kinds of things is a kind of cultural judgment um, of her that comes out of not having been born where she was born and gone through what she had been gone through, even though her mother certainly told her uh, about it. And you know um, that I have indulged myself in African art, so I'm also trying to learn through the art um, as well. I continue. <laughs> um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I'm sorry, the microphone is a bit oh, thank you. intimidating. Um, I have a, a question about your methodology because I see that this is a wonderful self-reflexive talk as much as it is an exposition of content. And I, I come to this question with the uh, reading of Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives, which is an incredible book, and I think that her methodology is just like yours, a kind of reconstruct of subjectivities that are lost to our present times. And so I try to think about documentation and storytelling as perhaps intention, especially mm -hmm. in historiographical um, methodologies. And so we've had three wonderful, maybe more, storytellers, and I'd like to think with you about your role as a storyteller yourself in your scholarship and how this brings tension, but also affordances in terms of creative uh, engagement and how your subjectivity is constantly at play in what you're working with. And that's an advantage, of course, but maybe I would like to think about the tensions with that. Well, you know, that's the big difficulty, is trying to decide how to use the stories, trying to uh, create your own stories out of bits and pieces of other people's story. I mean, the, the thing, the, the piece that I, the first storyteller who was um, Annie Williams, and she told the story of Aunt Rebecca, that story came out of literally four lines. Okay, four lines that I had to then build on. And so, um, it's her, her autobiographical account is completely lost except for those four lines. And so 
um, what you have to do uh, is with, very, with great caution, of course, is to find other stories. You've got to find other forms of evidence. You've got to look at church records. You've got to look at plantation records. Um, you have to look at court records. Um, a lot of the the things I talk about um, are represented as criminal, you know, not by the people who, by the victims. You know, the victim is criminalized in some ways or another. So, you know, it's all of that together, and then you've got to decide, you know, what what seems re reasonable and what does not seem reasonable. And that's, and that's horrible because a lot of things that are not reasonable are exactly what happened. You know, because, you know, we are talking about slavery. We are talking about bondage. So, you know, um, uh, so, you know, growing up myself with the stories from my mother um, of my family, and then we have a lot of storytellers in our, in our family, but um, they didn't really come together for me until um, I, you know, was at college. I was taking a folklore class. I was doing that kind of research, and then especially working with Professor Blastingame, who was a social historian, a groundbreaking social historian, and of course, I wanted to be just like him. You know, listen up, graduate students. Um, and so, um, and so, um, then I, you know, then I had the, the role then of uh, enjoying the stories that my mother had told me, being horrified by them, but also of trying to place them in some kind of broader context, and move moving on from them. Okay, so you know, it's it's, it's all of of that together. But I do see myself as a social and cultural historian. You know, and um, and I do like the narrative voice. I like for people to um, to relate to the people I talk about, and I also want the people who are my subjects to relate to what I talk about. That is, I want if I if they were alive and I was to, to read this story, that they might disagree with what I concluded, but they would at least would understand that I was talking about them. Okay, all right, so, um, and my graduate students know what I'm talking about when I say that. Okay, so I have a final question sign. Okay, all the way in the back, thank you. Hi, hello. Um, I'm curious because the first two histories came out of the WPA and also the last one from women that lived well into the end of the 19th century and beyond. If there were any efforts before the WPA on an organized basis to capture oral histories, um, perhaps during Reconstruction or even in the abolitionist community um, from self-emancipated uh, self slaves? Well, thank you for that question. Actually, there were attempts from the very beginning, well, not the very beginning, but you know, people have written in, in letters, for example, in letters and diaries, things about you know, small snippets of people's lives and what happened to them and that kind of thing. And people who were enslaved themselves, of course, began publishing their own accounts of enslavement you know, um, in the mid to late um, 18th century. So, you know, Autobacuguango, for example, I think is one of the first, there are many others, and then Mary Prince in the beginning of the 19th century, this woman from the Caribbean. Um, and then, of course, you know, people during the, the period of abolition, we have so many people who wrote about their lives as enslaved people. You know, we have 12 Years a Slave, for example, Solomon Northrup. Um, but, of course, Frederick Douglass, and his, he has three um, autobiographies. Um, this, uh, um, the woman... Um, uh, Octoroon, who wrote about um, her life, to um, the other person I'm not thinking of, but everybody knows who she is. Harriet Jacobs, thank you very much. Yes, Harriet Jacobs. Um, and so there were lots of those as well. We have a newspaper reporters who have, you know, interviewed people like the descendants of Sally Hemmings and Thomas Jefferson is interviewed, you know, um, in the night, early 19th century. So there, there are those other documents too. And so we have to, we take those documents and we use them against what we have with the WPA. So we understand, you know, a broader context. Is this something that happened to one person? Did it happen to many people? Do other people remember things happening like this? Et cetera, et cetera. There, there's a lot out there. Not enough, but still a lot. Thank you all very, very much. Okay. Thank you.